Welcome to the Exponential Minds Podcast. The research, development, launch, and growth of new technologies is creating incredible momentum in the modern world. Join futurist Nicholas Badminton as he talks with the innovators and the exponential minds that are tackling some of the biggest problems and creating solutions that are propelling humanity to the next level. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Exponential Minds podcast. My name is Nicholas Badminton. I'm a futurist. I travel the world I'm working with companies to help them see where we're headed, consider some of the ramifications of the decisions we make today, and uh, use creativity to try and imagine what that future looks like in 5, 10, 20 years. And today I'm incredibly excited. I've got a really uh, good friend of mine, Leah Zaidi, on the podcast with me. Leah is an award-winning futurist and foresight practitioner who's worked with and for a, a wide variety of organizations. Leah collaborates with a network of subject matter experts and process experts to deliver exceptional results for all sorts of companies and institutions. She's a good friend and an alumni of Dark Futures. She was a speaker at the first Dark Futures Toronto, uh, where she talked about speculative futures. And I'm excited to chat to you today, Leah. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I would love to start off, Leah, by understanding how you became a futurist, because it wasn't necessarily the first thing that you did in your career. No. So I like to describe myself as a recovering marketer. I used to have a career in marketing before I got into Foresight. But as I was doing the whole marketing thing from a variety of different angles, so I did the, I did the startup thing, I did the consultancy thing, I did the, you know, go work for a big company thing. Um, as that was happening, um, I had really developed this love of science fiction and it became something that I began to engage in much more deeply. So I started to write science fiction. I started to um, learn about the writing and publishing industry. Uh, and then I connected with some authors as well and uh, just got deeper and deeper into it. And so, um, you know, before I, I picked up and became a futurist or, you know, a proper foresight practitioner, uh, what I was doing is that I was writing my novel and I was critiquing um, and working on other people's, you know, novels as well. So I was doing some, some, yeah. So I was doing some substantive editing and some critiquing and that sort of stuff. So what happened was that I learned about this program called uh, a Master's of Design in Strategic Foresight and Innovation at OCAD University. And a few people told me about it. And when I saw what the program actually was, it kind of just clicked in my brain that I could combine all of the things that I like and I enjoy doing with the you know, practice side of things that I've been doing in my career and turn it into something new. And so uh, I went and got my degree and that's what set me up for what I'm doing now. That's cool. So uh, you, you sort of uh, took all of that interesting sort of background that you'd had and, and was kind of starting to think, hey, what about these fantastic futures that, that could exist in, in a fiction perspective? But now you're, you're back to applying that to the business world. So how's that transition been? For me, it's been really good because I, I look at science fiction a little bit differently than everybody else does, right? So a lot of the time people look at science fiction as entertainment or, you know, as a source of technology innovation. That's typically where our minds go when we think about science fiction. But I come at it from the socioeconomic and political angle. So I like to think of science fiction as a complex prototype for the future. And so, you know, there's a lot of different things that we can glean from what happens in science fiction from, you know, how is it that political systems evolve? Um, what are alternative economies uh, that we can consider? What's the, you know, nuanced behavior that we see um, when people within the context of science fiction stories are interacting with the broader systems and the worlds that they're inhabiting? So all of that paints for a completely different picture. And I think that makes science fiction sort of like this untapped resource that we can keep going back to for, for greater insights. So what, what were the science fiction books that, that you, you read that really switched you on about, uh, about really wanting to be an author in science fiction? Yeah, well, it's, the, it's a couple of the giants, really. It's George Orwell, it's Aldous Huxley, it's N.K. Jemisin, it's Ursula K. Le Guin. So, 
it's these stories that are in some way transcendent. Uh, they're not necessarily of their time, but they're very much so of their time. Mm. Um, and there's so many years, perhaps decades ahead of, you know, where we are even now. And so looking at how these stories become relevant time and time again was uh, a source of, I guess, enlightenment and inspiration for me. Yeah, I mean, it's the oft-quoted George Orwell in 1984. And I even, even find, uh, I, I, my favorite was Animal Farm. And I just found that to be incredibly interesting. I, I did a keynote about four years ago at the London Swine Convention. <laughs> uh, and and I, I put this big red slide up and it said, not all animals are created equal. Right. And, and, it, and it was provocative, right? And then I started talking about growing human organs in pigs on mass scale. And I think half the audience sort of left the room at that point and half <laughs> the other half had their mind blown. But, but like, you know, these, these are strange things that are happening today. But so, so it, it, it's interesting what you're talking there, complex prototypes of future political systems, like the nuance and interaction design. I mean, this is the, this is the work of a futurist. This isn't standing on stage and, and sort of waxing lyrical about abundance and robots in the future or anything like that. This is, this is useful foresight applied in a business context to help organizations get some kind of benefit today. What, what, what kind of uh, examples of projects have you worked on? Yeah, so it really uh, varies. It can go anything from understanding what uh, prototypes a tech company should be building and, you know, what the potential uses of those technologies could be, how people might run with them or break them or find ways to, you know, manipulate situations with them, to really, really grounded work uh, around policy and thinking about how our broader systems might evolve. And so the, the use of science fiction and futures um, as a broader sort of category is really to understand um, not only where things could go in the future, not in a predictive sense of like, this is what's going to happen, but understanding the spectrum of possibilities and then figuring out, you know, what do we do now? Ultimately, really good futures work should be about the present day. It's about mm -hmm. using the future, anticipating the future to understand what needs to be done today. It's really interesting when you say about hacking products. I, I always say that a product hasn't really found its true potential until someone uses it for something completely different, right? Right, and somebody will, right? So um, even now, like we're seeing examples of drones being used to deliver drugs <laughs> to people who right. aren't, you know, um, in isolation or being used to walk dogs. Like who would have thought that a drone would be useful for walking a dog while we're all in self-isolation? So these sort of things, like people will find new uses for them that you never think about. And you have to sort of think about the human aspect and human behavior of everything, not just, you know, the technology and its potential, but the potential of the human being who's interacting with it. And I think the, the, the hacking comes at these extreme circumstances. We're in the middle of this pandemic. I'm not sure what week it is. It depends. The f I think it, it depends on the first time you recognize that it was coming, right? So I think well, I don't know what day it is right now. So right. <laughs> exactly, exactly. We're all holed up and whatever. But I've, I've been uh, I've been writing, doing some research and writing writing some papers for some clients. And, and one of the things that I love is the maker community that's that stepped up. But the the one that that's really um, amazing. Is this, uh, is, is this full face mask used for scuba diving? And I, I was on vacation uh, just before Christmas, before, before all of this, and I was seeing these kids with this amazing full face mask, mask and it was um, so they could snorkel around. And now, you know, in Italy, they've been able to, like, uh, come up with new designs and turning them into ventilators. And it's a revelation. I mean, what's really interesting about it is <clears throat> then there's, there's, there's a conversation. Our, our mutual friend, Dre, and I ha had a conversation. It's like, uh, what about using these in a medical uh, context? Well, actually, if a patient wanted to use this hacked mask as a ventilator, which could save their life, they actually need to accept that, that they're not using a medical piece of equipment, right? Yeah. But mm -hmm. in, in these extreme circumstances, it's amazing. And, and, and that hacking and, and these new perspectives of, of, of futurism that you're talking about, the complex systems and, and such like, are really important and i know we've been back and forth a little bit about what's happening right now with covid19 and i i've been following you uh on on linkedin and a number of other channels and you've been putting out some really cool work around policy and uh 
And you've been looking uh, at using models like the Panarchy or the EcoCycle model to help model where we are and some scenarios. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love for you to take us through sort of uh, where you started and how you started uh, coming up with that work and, and where you are with it right now. The, the work really came from an insight, which was around the panarchy model that you just mentioned. So for anyone who isn't familiar with that uh, particular framework, it's essentially a cycle that uh, nature tends to go through. So we see, you know, with new species, there's a period of exploitation where there's rapid growth. Then, you know, as the species settle, like for instance, in a forest, they go through a period of conservation, which is, you know, everything stabilizes, the dominant species emerge. Then you go through a release period, which is just a rapid, you know, um, chaotic moment of everything just sort of falling apart. Um, and that is something like a forest fire coming in and burning everything down. And then what you get afterwards is a reorganization period, which is new things come together, new configurations. So that particular model um, has a, a second version to it, which is called a nested panarchy. And a nested panarchy says is sometimes the system goes into a revolt, but a fast acting event comes in and disrupts everything. And that revolt uh, triggers a release period. So what we're seeing with COVID-19 right now is a revolt that is creating a release, right? So we have this fast acting, fast moving event that's disrupting all of our stable systems. And then what you can have afterwards, which we might potentially see, is a remember. So a remember is when uh, the system remembers what it used to be before. So, you know, when we're talking about what happens after, you know, what do we, what do we become? How do our systems form? What changes? Well, that kind of depends on how much of the previous system we retain and how much of that we remember and how much of that influences what comes together now or what comes together later. So that particular model, um, once I started to think about it, it was like, okay, this is what we're going through. You know, this is precisely the pathway that the virus is going to follow. You know, it's exploiting, it's going to stabilize, it's going to create a, a release period where it breaks down, and then, you know, something new, a mutation potentially comes in and takes its place. How, how, do, how does, how does I, I, I really love that idea of remember, how does nostalgia play into that? Because nostalgia mm -hmm. makes us stick to our old memories of but like, wasn't it good back in the day the good old days you know i remember yeah. when and it's like i st i wish it was still like that right yeah i i think there's um an aspect of nostalgia that will definitely kick in but it depends on what comes after so i think it, it's related to loss aversion Right? The more we lose of what we genuinely liked and loved, uh, the more that nostalgia is going to be extreme and prevalent, um, the more we're going to see issues around that. Okay, so nostalgia will definitely play a role in all of this, uh, especially as it relates to something like loss aversion. So whether or not you know, we're nostalgic for what we lost is going to depend on whether or not uh, the things that replace the new normal that comes about is something that we perceive as being better or something that we perceive as being worse than what we have. And so likely there will be things that, you know, we, we miss a little bit, um, but then there'll be things that we gain from the process as well. And it comes down to a matter of whether or not uh, we have good systems in place to begin with, right? And how much our systems are working for us versus against us. So if we look here in Canada, we're seeing lots of interesting things emerge that could potentially be very positive in the long run. So things like uh, income during crisis times could lead to a universal basic income down the road because right now we're seeing the necessity for it and the case for it being made. Uh, but in the US where they're privileging the economy even above human life, what takes the place of that and how that evolves is a completely different trajectory, right? So the loss there is going to be greater as a result. Yeah, it seems like in Canada we've started um, we started, you know, essential services <clears throat> and going down to what the people need. <clears throat> I, I've had to give my renters in Vancouver some rent relief and I've done it because mm -hmm. it's the right thing to do. And right. it, it, it's on me, but like I can balance things and whatever. And, you know, I, I think that what's happened in Canada, whether it's deemed to be a socialist idea of distribution of wealth, sort of does align with those ideas of, of UBI. But you know why? Why aren't we? Why aren't we pushing these ideas of UBI out as standard? If if this is a great idea, 
Right. So um, in the province of Ontario, we ran this and Doug Ford did, you know, slash the, the initiative. And, you know, who knows how this is going to change afterwards and if his mind is going to change and his approach is going to change too. Um, surprisingly, he's done a good job at handling the crisis. Um, the, the case showed that, you know, UBI is effective and it can actually alleviate a lot of strain on our other systems like healthcare, for instance. Um, because there's no need for those services in the same degree when you're better taken care of and your well-being is, you know, improved overall. So there's there's going to be a case made for it, but, you know, crisis presents an opportunity to set up these things and make a further case for it. So right now, there's no arguing that mm. Canadians need help. You know, right. there's no waxing philosophical about it. There's no, you know, let's have policy discussions till we're blue in the face about it it needs to happen. And so the results that come out of this is that we can say, okay, it happened and look how beneficial it was. And, you know, now can we make a case for making this a more, you know, long-term uh, policy that we can actually engage in as a society? Yeah, it's really interesting. Actually, both in Manitoba, I think, ran a program called Mincom uh, from 1974 to 1979. And it was based on the same idea. And it was kind of a replacement of social security. Um, for for Dauphin Manitoba and it worked perfectly well and people were happier and healthier they worked harder mm -hmm. um, kids education was a little bit better and all of the metrics were going up and then the federal government changed so it, it all gets it all gets super interesting right. like we you know what's popular what's not but it, it's a wild idea that that directly challenges social security and qualification for for, for benefit and, and things like that. And I think that right now, there's probably this balance of like, we can spend billions of dollars administering a, a new social security system at this time of crisis, or we can just fast track it, save money, and, and pass on some of that benefit going forward. But I want to come back to the panic here and, and what you're talking about. And we were talking about this nostalgia of remembrance, right? Mm -hmm. well, what, what are the stages that, that come after that? The nest of panarchy talks about the revolt and the remembrance, but the panarchy itself, you know, when it cycles through, a reorganization period will happen after a release. And then yeah. it starts to, you know, go into an exploitation period again. So it just loops around constantly. Um, and so it's a, it's a matter of, okay, what are the new configurations that come about? What are the, the new ways and the new relationships and the new dynamics of that system? And then what gets exploited is an extension of that. Um, so it's just, it's a, it's the system falling apart, it's the system coming together, and then it's the system sort of finding a way to stabilize itself. So that's kind of what we're, we're going to go through. And the longer we're in this release period of the world is kind of shut down around us, uh, the more transformative whatever comes next is. And by transformative, I don't necessarily mean good, I just mean different. Right. And this is it. This is uh, I've got a really uh, close friend in, in London, Luke Robert Mason, and and uh, we had this chat. And he goes, "Well, you know, on the way to the future, some people are going to die." <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, you know, um, okay, it, maybe that sounds a little bit over dramatized, but it's not an easy ride to go from A to B when you're talking about societal change, whether it's transformed through a pandemic or whether it's uh, business as usual, right?" Um, there's still going to be people that do well, people that don't do well, or whatever. But we're we're sort of uh, as as foresight practitioners, futurists, uh, big thinkers, trying to see if we can create this equal and diverse world where everyone benefits. So, so what gives in this model? Right. So the the thing is that it's entirely contextual and cultural based, right? So the system that was existing before all of this happened plays a role in the system that comes next as well. And so what we're gonna see emerge is gonna be completely different than what the US is gonna see emerge, which is gonna be completely different than what China is gonna see emerge after this. Yeah. And it's dependent on what those deep-seated cultural narratives and myths are that are driving this change right now. So Canada is reacting in a way that's very Canadian, right? We're, we're reacting in a way that's like, okay, well, how do we gear up our social systems? Because even, you know, a conservative movement in Canada is not a conservative movement in the US. Like those are right. very, very different systems. So, you know, this 
agenda of let's take care of people, let's look after people, let's put our healthcare workers and our frontline workers first and figure out a way to sort of preserve the system is a different mentality than, you know, we're an authoritarian state and we're going to barrel down our people. So there's, there's that sort of context to take into account. Um, so whatever emerges next is going to be influenced by that. Right. So you've worked through a number of scenarios and you've started mm -hmm. sharing them as well. I'd, I'd love for you to share some of these uh, with us as well. Sure. So uh, what I did once I had the insight with the panarchy is that I started to stack up a, a couple of foresight models and put together a very big chart <laughs> of categorized things that could come up potentially. Um, and they fall into a few different categories. So it's a continuation scenario where we try to keep things as is. Uh, there is discipline where we go into, you know, potentially a longer release period where we really have to clamp down on what we're doing, both from, you know, top up angle and bottom up angle. Mm. And then we've got a, a full on collapse potentially where, you know, something could just fall apart altogether. Um, you know, one of my biggest concerns right now is that the U.S. is headed into hurricane season. And, you know, a single natural disaster could really tip the system and the scales in favor of something that's really, really more horrific than what we're already seeing uh, come out of the country now. Um, and then finally, a transformation scenario, which is really high tech, high spirited, um, about doing lots of good, um, more of the community angle, more of the empathetic angle. So uh, I put together those scenarios. And what I did is that I figured out, like, what are all the pieces of those particular uh, scenarios and how they could play out. And I looked at it with uh, another model that I created called Seven Foundations, looking at it from a variety of different aspects of the system. So the political angle, the economic angle, so on and so forth up to uh, about seven of them. So that sort of, okay, what does it mean when politics goes discipline, right? What does it mean when art goes transformative? Uh, looking at those configurations and then pulling those modular pieces out and creating, you know, more nuanced scenarios out of them gives us a better picture of what lies ahead. Um, and again, it's, it's context driven. So um, Canada right now is seeing some elements of business as usual with, you know, companies trying to keep going. We're seeing some elements of discipline with, you know, self-isolation and policies that are coming into effect to protect Canadians. But we're also seeing some elements of transformation, right? Like the setup for UBI, for instance, is a bit more transformative. So there's that sort of dynamic that's playing out. And what actually emerges is, you know, still a question, but we can start to track and look at, okay, are we going deeper into a discipline scenario? Are we going back to continuation? Are we aiming for transformation? Where do we lie in those states? And then what happens when we combine those and look at the relationships between those aspects? Yeah, do you, do you have some sort of discrete ideas? Uh, I, think, I think I saw something you, you shared on, on LinkedIn just mm -hmm. earlier today. Yeah, so uh, I put out a couple of ideas so far around, you know, what happens when you combine different things. Okay. When we look at like how we combine those different elements across scenarios and put the pieces together, we come up with an interesting set of new scenarios as well and more nuanced ones. So for instance, what happens when you put together mandatory conscription with AI with real time tracking? Well, we get something like minority report for pandemics, right? So we're already seeing a little bit of that emerge with the cell phone tracking and figuring out, you know, where spread could potentially be, you know, but what if we had a version of precognition for pandemics? You know, we know that this area is going to be affected greatly next. We're going to clamp down on it. Ontario just sent out that alert message today, an emergency message of, you know, you're at high risk if you uh, potentially don't stay home, there's a problem. So that's an, a scenario that could potentially emerge um, that there's already signals for. Another one was uh, this idea of a startup called Pantry, <laughs> obviously with an I instead of a Y at the end because right. you know, that's what startups do. Um, but when you combine something like a startup with fear and with prepping, what you could potentially get um, in a continuation scenario is a quarterly subscription to your most used supplies. So instead of me, you know, assembling my own pantry uh, at home, I could say, yeah, I need a, a pantry and here's my profile. You know, I live in Toronto and uh, I'm living in a one bedroom place and here's, you know, what I'm eating on a regular basis. 
you figure it out and you tell me. <laughs> so instead of kind of like a meal kit, uh, instead of getting meals every you know week or so, I'm getting every quarter, here's your stock up supply in case of an emergency or something like that. And maybe it comes with something interesting, like something to entertain myself with. Right. So, so you, you'd, you'd have like every three months, they'd send you three months worth of food. So you, you've yeah. already, you're already looking ahead and, and sort of, uh, you know, so, so suddenly you've got to have rooms in your house that are just stacked uh, from floor to the, the ceiling with a toilet roll, yes? Well, probably not because <laughs> the, the guarantee of this thing, of this idea would be that they take care of that for you so you won't run out. Right. right. And so um, you're, you're stocking and you're prepping and you're getting, uh, you know, some sort of algorithm in the background telling you, hey, you got to eat your beans now <laughs> or, you know, uh, time to stock up on that toilet paper again or whatever it is. So um, it's just a it's a response that we would see in a you know startup culture that is driven by fear and anticipate something going wrong again. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting, I think, that we look to the big tech companies uh, that, that are already starting to think about it. this is how they come up with ideas that they end up patenting. And, you know, we're, we're sort of in the midst of the Amazon, was it the Amazon zonification of the world, mm. right? I think Amazon's trying to hire another 100,000 people because it's completely overwhelmed. But there's a pattern that I've spoken about with a lot of my clients, which is called anticipatory shipping by Amazon that pr literally predicts that you're just uh, about to uh, run out of Lysol. I've got some Lysol wipes on the side here, or you're just about to run out of toilet paper and you don't have to go online and it keeps coming, right? <laughs> and it's like, oh, 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 how did you know? And it's like, that's because they know everything, right? Uh, yeah. they, they, they understand from everything which could be your, your cell phone and, and your online uh, behaviors in terms of what, what you're looking at and shopping for within the, the e-commerce platforms. Uh, and they, they can say, oh yeah, we know, we know what you need and when you need it. Um, it's kind of scary in a way, but like when we're thinking about foresight and futures, you know, how much do we push people into these uncomfortable zones where they are thinking about fear, they are thinking about being uncomfortable versus you know, these idyllic futures where like robot butlers are shining our shoes and, and giving us compliments every day. Well, um, as you know, I've been a proponent of looking at dystopias for a while now. Right. <laughs> um, I, I spend quite a bit of time talking about dystopias, and I've been talking about them um, and getting quite a bit of flack for them in the past, too, right? right. Uh, but this is precisely why we talk about those darker scenarios, because we're in one now, right? Um, the time to have had these conversations about what if something goes wrong was at least a year ago. We should have been having this conversation for years now. And, you know, had we better prepared and taken, you know, the everything's going to fall apart scenario a little bit more seriously before, maybe we would have been better prepared for it now, right? And so, um, you know, when I say that foresight work is really about looking at the future to understand what to do today, mm -hmm. it's really about like, hey, what could happen next? How do we prepare for that? You know, how do we prepare for multiple eventualities and take action so that when something does happen like a pandemic we're prepared yeah and how, how can we get people to take this seriously we were just talking about this and we should really bring this up uh you know being on calls and seeing the papers it's, it's a black swan we didn't see this coming uh, and i was chatting to a good friend of mine he's a, a futurist glenn Heemstra, a, a previous <laughs> a previous guest on the podcast and he was like in history probably the most planned you know speculative future uh, practiced scenario that we've ever done is around pandemics and we've kind of forgotten that it's a possibility and it's like yeah sure sure that's going to happen Bill Gates uh, spoke in 2015 at TED and everyone's like sure Bill I'm sure that might happen at some point but there's a super low risk we're not going to take it seriously and we you know we know that it's not a black swan because we've seen lots of instances of of SARS and MERS and Spanish flu and the Black Death and whatever. It's been here, uh, they, they've been and gone, and now it's here again. So um, I, I was looking at this phrase, the black elephant. It's the yeah. elephant in the room mixed with a black swan, which is like, wow, we didn't expect that. But it's always been yeah. there, and we've just ignored it. And, and <laughs> you were sharing with me that there's a few other ways of talking about this as well. 
Yeah, so there is a, a gray rhino, um, which uh, is an idea proposed by Michelle Bucker, who suggested that, you know, we're looking at a highly likely but ignored threat. Um, there's also this, con uh, this concept of the black jellyfish, which is, um, you know, a phenomena that uh, takes you by surprise and, you know, into a post-normal sort of state um, where it's just chaos instantly. So there's a, a lot of different terms floating out there, but the one that does concern me the most is the black swan, because that's the one that we as a society and as a culture sort of gravitate to and know really well. So we can argue about the nuances from, you know, the language perspective of what is this, but the fact is the public calls this a black swan. That's what everyone went and Googled after, you know, the pandemic um, started to get really, really bad. So that's the, the narrative that we really need to worry about. And the reason why it concerns me so much that we're calling this a black swan is because it suggests that it is something like a once in a lifetime event. We're not going to see it again but the chances are we will. <laughs> we will see another pandemic. It's more likely as issues like climate change get worse. So, you know, calling it a black swan puts everybody kind of at ease saying, okay, you know, we're gonna go through this one horrible thing and then everything will go back to normal and everything will be okay. The real answer is maybe not. So let's not call it a black swan because we set ourselves up for another problem in the future if we do. Yeah, absolutely. I'm caught, some people have been saying it's the once in, the once in a hundred year pandemic. Mm -hmm. And sure, it was like 1918, 1919 with the Spanish flu, but the Spanish flu stayed around until like the mid to late fifties. <laughs> it is like, it was still there. You know, this mm -hmm. is, you know, there's not going to be a post COVID-19 world. There's just going to be a world with COVID-19 and there's going to be flare ups. There's going to be re reemergence. And even if we've got herd immunity, there's still going to be people dying like there are from flu and pneumonia and, and other, other terrible things out there as well. Well, Leah, this has been absolutely fascinating chatting to you. And we, we're probably have to, going to have to come back and do another episode. I, think, I seem to say this to everyone I speak to, but that's because our work is continuing. Um, mm -hmm. What kind of, what kind of uh, thing are you up to next? Good question. <laughs> so I've just put out a massive document uh, that's available on uh, my company website called Multiverse Design. And uh, the next sort of steps with that document is helping, you know, different organizations understand what the implications of the emerging scenarios are for them. So uh, I may host a session around that and uh, give everybody a walkthrough on, you know, this is how we need to start thinking about things. But really the work I'm going to be doing is about getting the entire system or as much of the system as we can to sort of level up their understanding of how this is going to play out so that we're all in a better position to respond to what's emerging. And that's what we need. We need foresight practitioners to help the world really know how to get a grip on today by looking to the future. Leah Zaidi, foresight practitioner, futurist friend, uh, big thinker uh, and world changer. Thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Nick.